We're live on Bourbon Blog Live's nightly show with my good friend Trey Zeller, one of my favorite gentlemen in the business, founder of Jefferson's Bourbon. How are you, Trey? Doing great, Tom. Doing really well. It's getting better and better these days. Well, Sun's shining almost, but it's nice weather. It's bourbon yeah, drinking weather. So. Oh, it is. It's it's just great weather, and it sounds like uh, some really good news that you mm -hmm. just got that came across uh in the last hour or so from the governor, I'll let you uh, start out with that since uh, since this is live and this is this is bourbon you news. got it. So I don't know. All I got was an email saying June 8th, uh, we're able to open the, the distillery for tours. So mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll be uh, putting everything in place to get that ready. Um, as you guys probably know, we've been making hand sanitizer as well as bourbon throughout all of this. Really, have been down to two people in the distillery only for the last... 60 plus days. So um, in order to really make sure we have no one that's that's infected, it's been two shifts of two people wow. and that's it. So just so, two shifts of two people. So that number has really been small in order to keep everybody safe. And correct. you've been making the hand sanitizers. But again, for those just tuning in, uh, the news is out that this, it sounds like all Kentucky distilleries our I assume that, that's what the understanding I got that it came from the governor saying June 8th, June 8th. Uh, so uh, what do you what do you think that'll look like uh, for for your distillery, for others? What are your what are your thoughts? You know, I was talking about uh, we're planning on doing something in six weeks from now. And I've got some people that are very hesitant about what what's going to be going on in six weeks. And none of us know. But. I have a feeling that life's going to be very different six weeks from now, just as it was six weeks prior. So um, I can only anticipate that June 8th is going to be very different than it is today. Right. Um, right. I was on a Zoom call with a bunch of friends of mine from college yesterday and they're sprinkled throughout the country. Um, New Orleans, which was really hit hard, harder right. than most places. Uh, they actually went to work. Everybody was going into their offices or their place of business yesterday. Um, while I had another good friend out in LA saying that they're on lockdown until August. So, um, you know, different places, different things are going on, but I think, you know, there is reopening. I was just in, uh, um, out of state and, uh, you know, other places outside of Kentucky, they're, they're starting to get things going. Right. Things, things are getting going. It'll be great to have the distilleries back up and going. Right. Um, yeah. So I'm sure we'll, we'll be ready for it. Um, luckily with all the hand sanitizer we've been producing, <laughs> we've got no excuse not to have that thing pristine. It will be sterile. It'll um, be sterile. Right. And, and we've been discussing plans of bringing people back and how we'll do it at a distance. And it'll right. probably be control groups. And, um, but I, I know everybody's anxious to get going again. Sure, sure. Much like you did with two people, but as you go back to having uh, a larger staff at the distillery, what what's what's the total number of people that a distillery your size that would be in a distillery at, at a time anyway that working? Well, if we're not bottling, you know, when we're bottling, we we bring in more crews for that. But at any any one given time, we've got um, about a dozen at the distillery. Right, right. And distillers in both in Kentucky and across the country that I speak with. Uh, seem like they're making some really good plans to um, to make sure everyone is safe. Uh, you know, really thinking through it uh, from the guests to the employees. So, you know, we know that's what you guys will be doing, and it's very exciting to know. Again, June eighth is the day for Kentucky uh, distilleries that we'll see um, probably most reopening. Uh, maybe some may wait a little longer, but I would imagine most would get would get going again on some level. Uh, you know, I, I, you can only speculate, but I would assume we're anxious mm -hmm. too. I don't know if we'll, you know, I haven't seen any guidelines, anything like that. I right. just got an email saying June 8th, we're opening it back up. For, for the public. Again, most distilleries, many distilleries kept going, making hand sanitizer, sure. some making whiskey, some making both. But again, this is back yeah. in the public June 8th. Uh, distilleries and uh, bourbon, just the experience that, that Kentucky offers obviously so important to uh, Kentucky. Um, what will that mean to you just to see people coming back into the distillery? Oh, it'll be great. You know, it, it'll be very exciting. And it'll be great for the city of Louisville, which we're in basically the distilleries in Crestwood and the state of Kentucky, just because 
we've become so ingrained with tourism now based on bourbon and bourbon tourism. Um, it's great. Uh, and, you know, all the other ancillary uh, cottage factories or industries that have grown up around bourbon. Um, my dad, uh, who's on his fourth or fifth edition of Bourbon in Kentucky, where he has identified over 2,500 distilleries prior to prohibition in Kentucky that paid taxes. He's wow. got a great chapter on what a distillery meant to a community. And uh, he was talking, and this is referenced basically 150 years ago, but I think it's very relevant to sure. today and uh, probably even more so because of the tourist aspect of it. And, uh, you know, it's going to be great, you know, to get everybody back and, and going in a very safe and controlled environment. So um, it, as long as we put the proper place, the steps in control. I read also earlier today that Kentucky and North Dakota were the only two states that um, that meets the criteria put out by. And I, I, I want to say it was the president, but I can't. I can't recall who it was, but right. the only two states that meet the criteria to open back up and neither one of us actually have as of yet, but as other states have. So I think right. Kentucky is going to be as safe a place as you could possibly imagine to be. That's uh, that's that's so important and so good to hear. And so many great people joining in. I just want to say if you're joining in on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, ask questions down below, tweet back to us. Uh, we're going to be spending a little time tasting with uh, Trey Zoller, founder of Jefferson's Reserve. And I think we're already getting a few questions. Um, I'll have to look at these because someone's asking, uh, right, there's Ryan asking, what what uh, what voyage is, is the latest voyage, the 19? Is that the latest voyage? Uh, we just, we've got 20 back as well. 20 is back as well. So is that the, is 20 the cast strength? What's the very, very newest one? Yeah, the cast drink. The cast drink is a 20. So that's the one that would be the newest one. Uh, I'm going to be tasting a cast drink with you. Well, why don't we go ahead? Do we? Where do we want to start? Do we want to start with the ocean or the cast drink on our on the lineup? Or do you have another place you want to start on the lineup we discussed? Well, let's see. You mentioned the cast strength. Um, we could go right there. Why don't we go Actually, right there? the only ocean that I have in front of me right now. Actually, I do have. I've got a cast strength. And I also have uh, Weeded Voyage 19. So um, I can do either. Why don't we go from all good? Let's do the cast strength. I have some of the Voyage 10. Is that the one? Which voyage do you have? That's I have Voyage 10 as well. Voyage 10 as well. Excellent. Great voyage. And I know this is one that you had mentioned before that you thought, well, they're all they're all beautiful in their own right. But this was one of your favorites that was a. Um, it is. I think this one, I think it was 10. That won uh, Best in Fest at the New Orleans Bourbon Festival. Okay, right. Not well, just for cast drinks, but for the whole show, for the whole festival. It's actually won some some awards. Well, let's give this a try. And again, if you're watching, ask some questions down below. Tell us what your favorite Jefferson's is. Tell us what Jefferson's you're drinking. If you're not already drinking one, grab one because this is going to be fun. All right. <laughs> yeah, why not? Exactly. <laughs> so, Tom, you may know I'm not. Uh, this is kind of. Contrary to popular opinion these days, I'm not really big on um, cast strength, or really big high uh, high proofs, because I, I think it does kind of kind of kill your taste buds pretty quickly. Um, that being said, one of the things that I really like about the cast strength from the ocean, right. you know, it comes back. This one is what is this? 112, 114 proof. Uh, There's 112 proof on this one. Um, so it's a little bit lower proof, but as it rocks back and forth within the barrel, as it's on the ocean, it's not only picking up flavor from uh, the wood, but that wood also acts as a filter and strips the astringency of the alcohol. Right. So what's really happening is, you know, when you have all these flavors, additional flavors that are packed in that are innate from the ocean voyage, like when you cross the equator four times as we do, it sears or caramelizes the sugars in the wood and gives it that real viscous, real thick, chewy feel to it and sucks in the salt air and you get that brininess that really comes out in this cast strength. Right. Yep. And it's not overpowered by astringency because that astringency, again, is stripped by the wood. 
it's stripped by the wood. So whereas most cast drinks in the world of uh, of bourbon would be and and whiskey would just be really would be really overpowering. This one just isn't. This one it, it drinks at a lower proof, doesn't it? It really does. Even though it's 112, which isn't you know a real high cast strength, it drinks at a lower proof because of that. Because you really get a lot of flavor and less astringency. That is so tasty, and, and it's it soft. Excuse me. It's soft. I mean, for the proof, it's it is. Very soft yeah, it goes down more. so easy. And this, yeah. what I love about it, just coats your tongue so much. It is just really thick and just right there on there. Yeah, this is um, this is really nice. How now? How many? How often do you all do a cast strength? Once a year is once it? Once a year. Yeah, once yeah. A year. Once a year, it's about half the volume of a typical cast strength. Right. I'm sorry, half the volume of a typical voyage the cast strength is. So both the weeded voyage and the cast strength are half a typical voyage. And those both come out once a year. Um, we release them and yeah, they usually sell out pretty quickly. Right. Excellent. That is that is so delicious. That voyage, uh, that voyage 10, was there something that happened on that voyage that that you think really made it stand out? I mean, I know you enjoy them all in their own way, but was there a uh... you know, Tom, to tell you the truth, I don't recall. I was just looking. Um, on our cast strengths, we have, or not our cast strength, but all of our ocean voyage, we have on our hang tag is a ship log. But, and it just basically tells you what goes on with it. Um, I've got the 19, which is the weeded one, the weeded voyage in front of me. Right. That one, and I love this because we got a 40, excuse me, 30 different ports on five continents crossing the equator four times. So it's basically the same route every voyage. But depending on what time of year you take off or what you encountered along the way really makes a difference in the outcome of the bourbon. Yes. So I can tell you, like Voyage 19, we left in summer, uh, last summer, out of the Port of Savannah, down through the Caribbean, through the Panama Canal, over to New Zealand, pretty calm the whole way. But between New Zealand and Australia, uh, between Auckland and Brisbane specifically, just got pounded by a big storm. And we get daily sea conditions, whether it's calm, moderate, rough, or very rough, and average sea temperatures. Um, and went down into the Tasmanian Sea and back up. The whole time it was around Australia, just got pummeled. So it was about two weeks of just very rough seas, which would indicate a cyclone. Right. And made it up through Indonesia, China, uh, Japan, pretty, again, relatively calm. But the passage from Japan over to Tacoma, Washington, again, got pummeled by a big storm. Um, so it's great to be able to, to see what's going on. And when you're getting that those very rough seas, you're just getting a lot of movement because we're on the very the top um, of the bow of the ship. So it's exposed to the elements and you're getting as much pitch as possible. So those rough seas really make a difference. So, so those barrels are, are exposed to the elements. Well, they're in containers, in cradles, in containers. However, those containers have what would be like sunroofs on them that are open. So it's got direct sunlight on them. It's getting rained on. It's exposed to the elements. So, Maybe. yeah. I, I really want to go on one of these on these voyages. I mean, have, have you have you been on a, one of these these boats for a few days? I mean, what's the longest you've? I know you like to be on other boats. But what's the longest you've been on one of these boats? Um, not long. It just oh. no, no. They don't I really like a fancy cruise ship, but I think it'd just be fun to see it. Yeah, well, I've been on, and it, it's it's pretty cool to do it. And actually, we're going to do an event down in Savannah. Nice. Um, uh, when we have a voyage coming back. So we go in and out of the Port of Savannah. So we are planning that. Um, hopefully we're going to be able to do it this fall. Wow. Um, uh, you know, we put the original barrels on my friend Chris Fisher's ship, the O-Search. Right. And we still have four barrels on that ship at all time. And uh, I'm on that ship quite a bit trying to catch great whites. That's the original. And, uh, right. Yeah, that's the original. And the original. so we always tap into those and see how it's aging. Yeah, as I say, I see, see you're wearing the O-Search shirt there. It's a bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so O-Search that, O-Search, O-Search shirt. that you all still, um, that you all still use. We still do. Yeah. The four that we have on a ship, we auction off at different charities throughout the year. 100% of the proceeds going to O-Search. Um, 
as he boils it down real quickly. You know, he catches great white shirts, t- sharks, tags them and releases them in order to track the big predator in the ocean to see what's going on with the abundance of the ocean and try to maintain sustainability as much as possible. And he boils it down really easy. He wants to make sure that our grandkids have fish sandwiches to eat. And he shares all the information that he collects freely with universities, aquariums, marinas, it's anybody who wants it. So he doesn't get that data and you know kind of hoard it so he continues to get grants. Right. He gives it to anybody that, that can use it. That's so that pretty cool. cool. And, the, and the shark that's being uh, tracked oh. on Twitter, his name is, is actually is it Jefferson? What's the name? Well, we, they, they've got a number of sharks, but they did tag a great white, a 12 foot, seven inch great white in Nova Scotia uh, in October of 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, 45 days later, it pinged in Jacksonville, which is amazing. Uh, I was down in Charleston, South Carolina for the Wine and Food Festival recently, and he was pinging right off Charleston. Uh, harbor when I was down there, which is pretty cool. And that's kind of where he was last I noticed he was being. But if you come to the distillery June 8th, you can come by and see a 12 foot 7 inch replica of Jefferson's hanging in our distillery and uh, get a picture and a shot with him. Nice. So that's that replica will be in there. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, so, so many great questions coming through. Um, quite a few fans, but someone's a big fan. Uh, Tom, thanks for watching on YouTube loves the rum cask whiskeys and someone is asking um when's the next rum cask coming out they, they come out uh, how often um so typically the rum cask comes out once a year right. um we will have a rum cask coming out in september september okay of this year correct so we typically have that that launch at that time so that's a great one. It ages in our Gosling's Family Reserve barrels. So those barrels held um, rum for, um, excuse me, bourbon for four years and then rum for 16 to 20 years. So they're about 20, 24, 25 years old when we get them and put bourbon back into them for eight months. Excellent. And then on the oceans, uh, Jeff Schwartz, thanks for watching. Jeff is asking, is this just a big container ship? How do you describe the ship, the type of ship? It is. Ship? It's a container ship. It's actually a smaller container ship um, that we have, again, contracted to be on the very top of the bow of the ship. And uh, you know, as we tried to nail down different freight companies, they were like, okay, you want to send it around the world? No problem. We can get it done in 45 days. I'm like, whoa, whoa. We want to slow this down. So we really zigzag the globe. That's why we go out of Savannah, down through the Panama Canal, New Zealand, Australia, up the coast there, back across down the West Coast, back through the Panama Canal to the North Sea, hit some European uh, ports and back into Savannah and back up. Excellent. And so many great people watching tonight and and every night. And we're just glad Trey joined us in our first couple weeks of doing this. We started some... um, 60 or so days ago doing this. We haven't missed one night, but just for those of you watching right now, every night come back to bourbonblog.com forward slash live. That'll be always our most recent video or wherever you're watching right now. Uh, We have some other great guests for this week coming up, but every single night we're interviewing someone in the whiskey business, spirits business, food, cocktails, every night, 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, So Tom, have you been putting your bow tie on every night for the last 64 nights? Right. How about it? I, yeah, or I'm, I could, going, I'm going the other route. I'm going long <laughs> hair and t-shirt. Yeah. Or maybe I, I could get a bow tie like tattoo. That would work too. You know. <laughs> there you go. Then it would be like it would be never changing. It would, but that I think this may look a little better, uh, especially given the current state. But uh, this is uh, no, this is so much fun to have you back, Trey, and we love that everybody's watching, asking so many good questions. Uh, how many total? How many total miles? Uh, does one of those ships, because it's several years, right? How many miles would that be? I don't, do, you, do you know how many? Oh, shit. Tom, I, I don't know that. I do know that the first voyage was over 6,000 nautical miles. Over 6,000 miles. That was the first voyage. I have right. not added up. That would be kind of a fun little exercise to do. wouldn't be hard right. to figure out. But well, that, that, that question, know. actually, I'm looking at Facebook, came from my dad. So my dad was curious about that. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. Dad had a good question. Oh, you can always count on Dad for a good question. 
to, to quiz you. But it's, but the number of years is something like three ish, three and a half, four that usually usually goes on. No, no, actually, the first voyage was three and a half years. The first voyage was correct. Right. That's what I was now saying. it's about eight months. Eight months. So this is a while. This is a lot of miles. So yeah, first, you got it. Yeah. You know what's been really fun, and I did not know this, and I'm being in the Navy, but Navy men, when and anybody that's on a ship and it crosses the equator, they go from a poly swag, a polywag to a shell box, and wow. there is a big ceremony. Typically included some pretty rough hazing the first time you cross the equator and become a shellback. Wow. And um, unbeknownst to me, it has become a Navy tradition to have Jefferson's Ocean um, that is given to the shellback once he has crossed the equator, gone through the hazing, and on the celebratory other side of it, they celebrate with Jefferson's Ocean, you which I think is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That's now that's really something quite a, quite a great celebration. So yeah. fairly recent, the last few years, this has become a, a celebration. Correct. Yeah, I just had different people in the Navy you know, reach out for me and tell me this whole story. Yeah. I don't know anything about it. Are, are, are you going to become like the honorary member? Are they going to put you through the hazing and then let you try some if you ever take that trip? You think? I hope so. Yeah. Come yeah they got to haze me. I mean, I, I, no free passes. <laughs> I don't know that I want to be, but. I, you know, you can't be a shellback without earning it. I'm sure. That's right, absolutely. Well, this this cast strength is so good. I mean, obviously, we always uh, and as we're always really happy to feature uh, the Jefferson's Ocean on our Why Whiskey Educational Tour. Uh, people love it. They get different notes. Many people get those notes of salt, uh, the iodine that comes from the ocean, and I get that too. But the 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 delicate, elegant sugars on all the oceans. The sugars are so. They're so much more refined than most um, bourbons. Talk right. about that. How, do, how are these sugars coming through? You know, so when we, we put those barrels on for the first time, and not being rude, but I'm going to dig up a quick picture for you. Yeah, please do. Please do. Um, the first time we put it on the ship, we put Newfield bourbon um, on my buddy's ship for three and a half years. Right. And what came back was pretty spectacular. That was the very first uh, round you did. Correct. So if you can see this, that wow. middle bottle is only three and a half years old. So we knew some interesting things happened. One, you know, you've got that constant contact with the wood, which is giving it flavor, which is acting as a filter and stripping out the astringency of the alcohol, giving it flavor. Right. So we took one of those barrels and we sent it back to the uh, headquarters of the Independent State Company in Missouri. And they broke it down and they'd never seen caramelization like that. That extreme heat that it's exposed to just sears and caramelizes that sugar. And that's why you get that, you know, just that chewy, thick, viscous, real serious. caramely molasses, you know, just, as you said, refined sugars that really come out. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's from that, you know, it, if it's, let's call it 100 degrees of the equator, it's going to be 130 plus in those shipping containers. Right. It's hot and it's humid and that sea air just permeates it. So that's why you're getting that brininess. You know, when we did the Jefferson's journey, which we reenacted taking bourbon from Louisville down the waterways to New Orleans and putting on ships and sailing it down around Florida and back up. And we were on the coast for eight months. We didn't, we got the same attributes. We got the same thickness. We got the same caramel and those sugars you were talking about, but we didn't get the brininess. And I think that's because even though it was on the coast, it wasn't out in the middle of the ocean where you just have that atmospheric pressure permeating that sea air and that salt into the, into the bourbon itself. So, so for for the journey, it wasn't the fact it was seeing the ocean. It wasn't the fact of a lack of ocean. It was was the lack of the atmospheric pressure. That I think so. Correct. Yeah, right. because it was you know we're on the we're hugging the coast, but we're on the ocean for eight months. Wow. Um, here we're out in the middle of the ocean, and it's and it's really different. Yeah. We don't even realize how different it is until we see what kind of um, the, the, you know the experiments and the whiskey that comes forward and, and how interesting it is. The, the Jefferson's journey, um, 
you think you may do any projects like that in the future? We have a way that we want to commercialize it, and uh, would love to do that. And that that probably isn't in, too far in the distance future. Something that would be a little larger release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, and what was great about that is we had, and again, we tried to do this as historically accurate as possible. And it really, my hypothesis was the reason that bourbon proliferated in Kentucky was because of the voyage that it went on. Right. And whiskey actually turned into bourbon going on that voyage for the first time. And people in New York, Philadelphia, Boston that were paying so much more for the, the whiskey coming out of Kentucky, um, in my mind, taste a lot more like Jefferson's Ocean than bourbon that's typically distilled and aged in Kentucky. And I think that journey proved that. And when we sold it together, you had a bottle, of, you know, 200 milliliter bottle of one that went on the journey and one bottle of bourbon that was distilled on the same day, but aged in Kentucky. Wow. And just the difference between the two or the night and day. Yes. I, I remember tasting those, how different they were and what a difference it made and what a cool, uh, journey to recreate from Kentucky down to New Orleans. And then it went up the coast and ended up, uh, the last spot was, um, was it New York? Was that right? New York. Yeah. Last we spot. actually landed in New York a year to the date that we took off, had two hurricanes, a tropical storm. It took us four boats. One boat got destroyed. Um, we had to siphon the juice out of one barrel into a new, a new barrel down in Key West. So it was a hell of a journey. I'm sure it was the most expensive bourbon ever produced. Right. Oh, yeah. Was because um, you only had two two barrels, right? You said two barrels. Two barrels, correct. Yeah, two barrels. Well, let's try it with the uh, the uh, cast strength was incredible. I'm going to move on to. Do you have the 17? Which 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 Jefferson? I don't have a 17 with me. However, I have a. You can do the 17. We'll do do two two different ones. While you do that, I'm going to have a barrel sample of our. 19 we did voyage okay that which is which is what the the 19 and the 20 are the, are the newest and i love the weeded voyage um i think i maybe finished my last bottle that 19 that was so nice uh someone asking the question okay jeff jeff thanks for watching uh were you, trey were you surprised at the saltiness in the bourbon when the voyage series first started so when this whole thing started was it a surprise to you how salty it was or the level of? Absolutely. I didn't know what to, to expect. Um, yeah. And actually, we had uh, three journalists come with us, one from Esquire, one from New York Times, it was Wall Street Journal, excuse me, and Men Health. We didn't know what to expect when it came out of the barrel and it was black like that. And it was thick and it was absolutely delicious. But when it came out black, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what it was going to taste like. And I did not expect it to be salty at all. That was something I did not think that would happen. You didn't think anybody would have a, a little bit or very little, if any? It didn't cross my mind to think no. that it would be. Um, so once you tasted that, what was your, the next step was, okay, the next voyage how did that how did that impact what you were thinking for the next voyage? so you know right away one of the guys came up and said this is like three spirits in one it's like a dark rum because of the, the just the caramelization that happens it's like a scotch that is from one of the islands um because of the briny influence and it's a bourbon at heart right and, and then at the same time somebody dubbed it the salted caramel popcorn bourbon <laughs> very nice Right. Pretty much summed it up. So you're trying the 19, which is weeded. How much? How much more weeded? What's the the difference? So really, the difference is you know what you're tasting is a rye small grain, and this is a wheat. So the rye is obviously more spicy. Right. Um, the wheat, which is softer, allows the flavors that are more innate from the journey to really come through. So you'll get that brininess a little bit more amplified. You'll get some of the, you know, vanillas, butterscotches, whatever you, you know. Yeah, and it's you know what? It's actually been a little while since I just I had this close by and I opened it. It's and I had tried the seventeen, which would have been would that have been about a year and a half ago. How long would go the seventeen come out? Maybe that's about know. accurate. Yeah, about a year and a half ago. And I remember thinking when I first tried this, um, I think it's. I mean, I think it really is characteristic of the other voyages, but 
I think that there's a little bit more brininess in 17 than other voyages. I do get that a little bit more forward against the the creaminess is what you, what you were talking about. But I feel like there's potentially a little bit more brininess for me on 17. I'm getting this a lot out of 19. Yeah. Compared to the cast strength, way more brininess in this. Wow. Now, I, and I, you know, it depends on the barrel too. I've been doing a lot of barrel tastings of 19. So I'm doing ver virtual barrel tastings for different retailers and on-premise right. accounts. And um, this is one that I'm having right now. This is from barrel 114. This one, and the front of my tongue, the side of my tongue, just. Phew. Wow. What does that look like for um, for retailers when they're looking at, do they get to pick from several different uh, barrels from one voyage? How, if, you know, for retailers that are well, buying, it and doing it, how it, it depends. Do We've been able to send some, a couple different samples that they can choose from. I've had some where they haven't been able to get the samples, but I've been tasting a couple for them and right. telling the, articulating what I'm getting out of it. And they pick the one that they think that their customers are going to enjoy the most, or uh, they just say, Trey, go pick it out. Wow. That's nice. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. I've had a few of those and I think that they can really showcase something completely different in those single barrels because this is, I mean, to get a consistent product that you're looking for with regard to um, the ocean, what is that blending process uh, like for you when it comes to releasing the, the general releases with blending just the right amounts? How does that go? How does that work? So what we do on our typical voyage is that we just dump all the barrels together. Just now we do it, it, correct. Yeah. So it comes off, we have to run them through customs. Um, so they have a landing area in Louisville that uh, they're staged in for about uh, about 30 days before they can come to the distillery. And then we get them and then we dump them on our tanks and um, you know go through the process from there. So it's just taking all those barrels, Every bit, you know, people ask this all the time, is all the juice that goes into the bottle, 100% of it on the ships the whole time? And yes, they are. It's, yes, all, it it's all been on the ships. And as we look at the single barrels, those can really be different. What are the what are the different notes that you get on those single barrels? How, how well, just like, are, they, are they really? Like this really one different? right here. This one predominantly, man, I get salt right away. Wow. Front of the tongue, side of the tongue, this is really jumps out is one that's got a lot of brine. And again, those weeded voyages allow for that stuff to really kind of show its head because it is, um, you know, it's not competing with the spice of the rye. Um, we've got others that uh, get a real toffee flavor, honey and toffee almost coming in because it's, it, all of these that go on the ocean are more viscous and thicker, chewier than you're going to have any other bourbons. Wow. Again, it's a caramelization and constant contact with the wood. But, yeah. um, so those things are what are most prevalent. Sometimes it's a combination of those, a little less briny. This one I would say right there, that's a salt bomb. Just what, I love, salt. what I love about these that I'll, I'll call salt licks it sometime. <laughs> as soon as you have them, take a taste it's kind of like being at a bar where you've had salted popcorn and you got a beer right it, you know, it just makes you want to pick it right back up and drink it so you've got that salt that's resonating on your tongue so you want to drink more so it's kind of a kind of well, you just keep going back to it yeah yeah <laughs> that's always a good good, good for depletions <laughs> that's that's excellent so if you have a question for trey uh jefferson's bourbon down below on Facebook, YouTube, tweet back to us on Twitter. Uh, Daryl, thanks for watching us on YouTube. He says he just poured a glass of Ch Ch Chateau Pichon Baron. We're going to get to that here in a moment. We're going to try that one. Uh, we'll keep on tasting this um, ocean a little bit longer. And um, somewhat, well, I think Daryl also had another question. Have you considered doing another ocean that's three plus years on the actual ocean voyage? Are you all thinking about doing that at some point again? On the O-Search, we leave them out for a little over a year, and they get a lot of age in that year for that time. And then we auction them off. Um, it, no, we probably won't leave it on that long. Um, again, the point of keeping those barrels on there is to auction it off. And again, all the money goes 
to the osearch.org charity. Right. And people can find that auction. Do they find it on the osearch website? How do they find it? Typically right now, and we're looking at how we're doing it. Um, okay. But to date, we're doing it with a specific um, charitable event. Sure. That we can tie it off, tie it back into. Excellent. That is that is incredible, and what a great uh, cause to raise money for. And you were mentioning earlier, there's potentially a little celebration. You guys are well when we get everybody back. The distillery now know, and everybody who's just coming in again, June eighth is the date that distilleries will be opening back up in Kentucky. That's the date they can open back up to the public. Yeah. You all are thinking about doing some kind of a celebration to say welcome back. Well, you know, it's it's just something that you know, obviously respectful, but uh, you know, it, this is we got to move forward and we got to go on and we uh, and we got to celebrate it, and right. and that's how I feel about this. And so I want to do a little reopening road trip. Um, so I'll be at the forefront of going to new places as they open. Um, we're doing it with one of our partners. Um, we haven't released it yet, but it's one of our collaborators that we've uh, worked with on a previous uh, project before, a previous release. And they're going to be with me as we go from state, excuse me, not state to state, but we're, we're going to some select uh, cities across the country. Excellent. Um, taking something with us along the way. And I'll be driving uh, the entire way until we hit uh, the West Coast. Um, but working with local charities in these markets to raise money for the service industry. What we've decided to do is hit local charities in each market because we feel like there's less um, overhead and that money's going truly to the people that need it our partners in the past. So uh, we're putting all of the particulars together about it right now. It's uh, we've got it all laid out in theory. Now it's just time to execute. So really pumped up about that. I'm going to dedicate a good part of my summer uh, taking this road trip and uh, opening right. things up and, and celebrating saying, Hey, man, we got through this. Uh, let's, let's pick up a glass and cheers to, Everybody who made it through, you know, help. We are so fortunate that retailers uh, have been able to stay open. And, right. you know, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, thank God we've all had, been able to enjoy a drink at the end of the day after you know, what everybody's going through. But some people aren't nearly as fortunate as we've been. Um, and, you know, it, we want to do what we can to, to help them out and to move forward. And that's all we can do is move forward. Absolutely. In a healthy way. In a healthy way. And we can't wait to hear the news uh, when it happens. We'll certainly announce it on bourbonblog.com. And thanks for sharing that teaser with us, Trey, to help celebrate mm -hmm. um, great establishments. And of course, I'm looking forward to getting back on the road too, doing some whiskey education. And hopefully that will be happening um, sooner than later. Uh, yeah. What do you, what do we want to try next? We got several great options. We tried, um, what do you, what do you feel like? You want to go? You want to do a little twin oak? Let's do some twin oak. Let's do that. All right. Do the twin oak. Get it right here. This twin oak is delicious stuff. And this is um, when was this? You released this? Was it about a year and a half, two years ago? How long ago? How long has it been? I believe this was December of eighteen. Eighteen, but a couple of years, yeah. Well, the, the runs the, together. This we're about to celebrate our twenty third year. Really? Congratulations. Yeah, it's hard to believe. When will that be coming up? Excuse me? When's, that, when's your uh, anniversary date for that? You know, actually, we did already. It was uh, mid-April. Mid so I guess we have. We just haven't celebrated. Uh, <laughs> Happy I'm not sure. That's great. Yeah, thank you. I didn't have all this gray hair when I started this. <laughs> I used to be the young kid on the block. That was, that was a long time ago. Um, well, whiskey, well, whiskey's, well, whiskey's kept, whiskey's kept us up. I, you, I just got a big echo there. I couldn't hear you, Tom. Whiskey's kept us all young, I hope. Has I, that's what it is. That's what it, it is. is. I hope. <laughs> what, we, what will happen is once we're able to go ahead and open, we'll have a celebration. We have a new barrel tasting clubhouse, which I'm calling Little Monticello. 
that uh, is right next to our warehouses in Crestwood, Kentucky, that uh, we uh, have been putting together. And it's like a, a great sports bar that uh, we have big rack of bourbon barrels and we'll have those barrels in and rolling new ones in and out all the time. So we'll have our barrel customers that want to come in and pick barrels. We'll have them out there. Um, just completed a 20 foot beautiful bar. Um, nice. It's, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So I can't wait to start to having some events out there and having customers out. And I have a feeling that that's where our celebratory, uh, 23rd year will, will take place. Wow. And that, that some sort of celebration will also be in, in the works for, uh, when all that uh, gets back up and going there at the little Monticello. That's, was that, that's, that one's, that's uh, a fairly new structure you've had for a little while. Well, it, it's, it's a repurposed structure. Repurposed. I think I remember you showing it to me. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, we, we put lipstick on a pig and it's really pretty <laughs> cool. I've got this great, big, huge chandelier. It used to be a shop. And, you know, oh. um, so it, the juxtaposition of, of what you know, we had actually did a partnership with Restoration Hardware where they came in and helped outfit us and um, put everything together. And so we've turned the shop into something pretty cool. We we'll have pool table, ping pong table, fire pit. Um, it's going to be a great place to hang out, maybe watch a game, play some pool, drink some bourbon, pick a barrel, enjoy life. Nice. So it's it's going to be a, an event space and sort of a, a whole new tasting room for special events. Correct. Excellent. Very nice. Correct. And little so, Monticello comes from Thomas Jefferson's home, Monticello. Right. Again, this was a shop, so it's kind of tongue in cheek that it's little Monticello. Um, right. <laughs> that, that I remember. Cool. I knew it had some sort of John Jefferson's tie-in. That's that's uh, that's very cool. Well, tell us about uh, this Twin Oak is such a special project you've um, done with such a unique barrel. What's, yeah. What is this so unique? So it was kind of the combination of uh, about eight years work, actually, Tom. I became a barrel chef in 2012 at Independent Stave Company at their corporate headquarters in uh, Lebanon, Missouri. And I've been to the Coobridge in Kentucky, in Lebanon, Kentucky, countless number of times. And... The bourbon barrels there are pretty done root, very rudimentary. You know, four levels of char, about the only deviation that you have. Um, and they make them over and over, and they make beautiful barrels, and they in turn make fantastic whiskey. But as I became a barrel chef, um, I basically followed a computer screen and threw more kindling on the fire or doused it with some water to follow kind of graphs on this computer screen to get certain time and temperature to bring out certain flavors. And I saw all the different techniques that different spirits and wineries were using around the world. And Independent Stave Company has somewhere in the neighborhood of a dozen cooperages around the world that service and supply barrels to the wineries and spirit companies around the world. Right. And I, you know, they've been a bit, they were also celebrating their hundredth year anniversary. So they've got generations of knowledge and they have scientists and oodles of R&D that they put into it. That Why are we so rudimentary in bourbon that we're only aging in these specific barrels? And uh, I guess for the first time, we had 13 different barrels that we put four-year-old juice in and we had all different type of variables, new bourbon barrels, with wine head, new you know, wine barrels with bourbon heads, with staves suspended that have been seared or slow cooked, extra seasoning. And I tried them each month for 36 months and charted them and kind of charted how they did and picked out a couple that I really liked. And since that time, we've done hundreds of different variables. And I got down to one that I really fell in love with. And we made a proprietary barrel in conjunction with independent stave and put 10-year-old bourbon in it. And um, where we aged like our Pritchard Hill cast finish up to 15 months, this was only a four month finishing because it imparted so much flavor. But with this barrel, we extra seasoned the wood in the yard before we grooved it out, which gave it twice as much surface area. 
we put a flash jar to open it up and then we toasted it to bring out mocha flavors. So it, um, it packs in flavor. And, There's so uh, much happening. There really is so much happening. And this is a barrel that, that uh, you co-created with independent stave and just has so much to, to deliver to that whiskey. It really does. And what's great about it, you know, it's a double barreling. It doesn't take out too much oak. Um, because that wood has so much going on with it. Again, I've got another barrel sample for our Twin Oaks. <laughs> so, so you have a barrel for bottle. I'm going straight for the barrel samples. <laughs> the barrel. Now, what's the, what's the proof of the um, of the barrel sample? Well, the barrel sample's already been cut down to ninety to proof. Okay. Proof. And um, this one comes right around ninety point two. Yeah. So we cut it down when we send out barrel samples to bottling proof so they'll know what it's going to taste like. So that little bottom label kind of tells you the story of what goes in behind it. Very nice. That's uh, it's very tasty. Well, I, I do get those mochi fl mocha flavors, some nice uh, butteriness. I mean, there's this wonderful flavor of it feels like, again, the age on this is about how old? We look it's at 10 that. years before we put it in the second barrel, which you were on that second barrel for only four months. Four months. I mean, it has it has a deeper, I mean, even though 10 is quite a while for a bourbon, this does have a much deeper, older note to it. I mean, there's a lot of creaminess, that butteriness that you only get on older bourbons. The barrel really is something unique. It's uh, This is a delicious bourbon. I really like the Twin Oak. Yeah, it is. Um, this is uh, non-chill filtered. Um Available. This is available across the country. Then this is one that's a little tougher to find. Right? It is. We. It's a you know a yearly release. Um, we have you know we've got product in the marketplace right now, and then we'll have it out again in early January. So we'll be seeing it if you they can't find it now. Everybody watching, uh, anyone who's looking for that, they would see it in early January. Correct. I would say if you see it on a shelf right now, snag it. Because you may not see it again for Correct. a little while. Yeah, that's, um, that's such great stuff. Someone, uh, Frank, is uh, says he's opening the Chateau Sudero Sauterne. Uh, very different from the other flavors. Very flavorful wine flavored. That is a beautiful uh, one as well. So people are really, people are breaking out their uh, their favorite Jeffersons as they're watching us. I, I like yeah, I heard somebody mention the Pichon Barone earlier as well. The Chateau yes. and the uh, Pichon Barone are both out of Bordeaux. One yep. a Sauternes and one a Cabernet, um, which I love the juxtaposition between Pichon Barone being a Bordeaux cab versus like the Pritchard Hill being a Napa cab. The Napa yeah. cab is so fruity, like you would expect from Napa, and the Pichon right. Barone is so earthy, like you would expect from um, from Bordeaux. But what I loved about both Pichon Barone and Chateau Sudero is Thomas Jefferson visited the chateaus. Love their wine. Actually, the Sultern um, Chateau Sudero was his favorite. Uh, he wrote about it extensively, both of them. He served them at the White House and then cellared them at his house in Monticello, which is a pretty cool story to have that full circle. That is and amazing. And both of those wineries, of course, very old wineries still around today. And yeah, that's where you get the house from. Yeah, yeah. Both very limited. Will we be seeing uh, more of um, either of them in the um, the future? Not in the next twelve months. Okay. So again, if you can find either one of those, I would expect. <laughs> so we may. So there's a possibility, or we will we have, have more Pichon for Barone for sure. Chateau okay. Sudero, I don't know. Okay. So we may see. More Sudero, but look in about 12 months for the Pichon Barone. If you can find it again, it's it's something that's so special. Do we want to do that one next, or do we want to talk about uh, Pritchard Hill? What do we want to talk about next? Um, let's do Pritchard Hill because, uh, actually, I've got that on the rocks right now. Okay, um, excellent. And I'll tell you what I really like about this, um, and I'm probably drinking more of this than anything right now. It's, it's on a big it's rock. one of your go-tos. It is. Um, one of the great things, this was in the last couple of months, I had somebody, a big bourbon guy, tell me, Trey, first time I had the Pritchard Hill Cabernet finish. And let me tell you about Pritchard Hill. The Chapelais who own the winery have become dear friends, great, great folks. And the winery is amazing. 
Um, I think it's been rated the number one winery tour in California the last three years. It's on top of Pritchard Hill. They're the only one that can use that appellation. Pritchard Hill is known as the Rodeo Drive of Napa these days. And they pioneered mountain um, uh, growing grapes on a mountain. And this is known as a mountain cab, all grown between 1,000 and 2,000 feet, which makes the wine very stressed and the sugar all come out into the grapes. And it gives it a very distinct black cherry or black currant flavor with mocha flavors, chocolate flavors that yeah. really come through. And it's that chocolate fruit. Both, isn't yeah, it? It really. And so I love the wine. I was able to get together with Cyril Chapelet and he was happy to give me some barrels. Um, we took six to eight year old bourbon, finished it in the barrels for 15 months or up to 15 months, 12 to 15 months, actually. And we get all that fruit out and it brings in the black cherry and the chocolate flavors into it. Mid palate, it turns into all bourbon and then you get that fruit on the back end. But recently I had this guy say, Trey, when I first had it, I hated it. And it's my favorite bourbon now. And he said, Trey, it's kind of like having an iced tea and taking a sip of it or you think it's iced tea, but it's actually a Coke <laughs> and you're not expecting those flavors. Right. And so you weren't ready for them. And so you don't like it. He's like, but when I sat down and appreciated it for what it is, I fell in love with it and it's now my favorite bourbon. And it wasn't until he articulated it like that to me that I understood where he was coming from. And he's exactly right. I did another podcast or a video cast, a uh, webcast the other day. And the guy said, this drinks more like a cab almost than a bourbon. It is so, you know, we're in there for 12 to 15 months. It's what happens the first 30 to 60 days, you get a lot of that wine flavor comes out. And it almost right. tastes like you're having a sip of Cabernet and then a shot of bourbon on this, you've got all that time for those molecules to really come together and work out well. And it, it is, it, it's a lot of fruit in here. There, there is a lot of fruit and it is one of those that I've, I've always been a fan, but the more I drink it in one sitting, the flavors will really um, evolve. The, the flavors evolve on the palate. Um, and it's, it's part of the reason why that happens because it was finished in those barrels. What what do you attribute that to as far as the, the evolution of flavors in, in one sitting? Yeah, it's been in there for so long. It is. Yeah. It's one of these. The, the, it's a great thing. It, it opens up very nicely, I guess, kind of like a wine. You know, you decant that wine and those those fruit flavors come out over time. And I think it does that on your glass as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's very tasty. And um Again, the Pritchard Hill Cabernet cask finish. This one, is this a once a year release? Is this, how do you? No, no, this is pretty much a full-time uh, in our portfolio. It's not okay. quite. So, but we're building it up to where it's more and more available. Right, right. It's uh, it's delicious. And you enjoy it, you enjoy it on the rocks. Are there any other ways you've experimented with it in cocktails or anything more, more just on the rocks or? On the rocks. I've got some... Uh, barrel aged black cherry bitters then i might throw a dash in but nice. i'm not much of a cocktail guy so <laughs> this is a cocktail <laughs> it's kind of a cocktail on its own with all those flavors it's yeah, really really it is. yeah so yeah. That, that's pretty much how I, how I drink it but i really enjoy it and as yeah. you said you got some pichon brown with you i don't have any with me um but you can pour some and I could virtually pour you some, couldn't I? You could, and you can tell me the difference. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Um, yes, I will do that. I'll get the uh, the Pichon Baron here, and and do that. Absolutely. Now this is great. So as I'm pouring this one, uh, tell us. I know we mentioned it a little tease of it earlier. Uh, new release that's coming up. Also before the end of the year will be the rye whiskey finished in cognac casks uh that's what's correct. what do we have to there is that that's what it'll look like right there let's get it right there close to the uh very nice is that that's not even out yet it's not but so we're getting a little we're getting a preview of what this will look like a brief peek at it right there yeah. 
it looks a little bit like your other some of your other rye whiskeys a little bit the front of the bottle does doesn't it yeah so the older... it's got the profile of thomas jefferson and the uh, 13 stars on there very nice so uh yeah and well, it, it turned about. out so well you know it really it is what i would call a sipping rye Wow. It's got so many big flavors. And again, this was extra finished. So um, at least 12 months in there really gives a ton of flavors. So at least a year in those cognac casks. And were those uh, VSOP? What types of cognacs were those? Well, I will really, I, I'll save it all until we're, we have okay. a proper release. Leave it to me to ask all the specifics. So we all we know is it's a cognac that has. Um, really given its love to that beautiful rye whiskey. And we're going to get some nice hints of both cognac, rye, all those flavors come together as one. What what are they what do those flavors do when they come together? You get a lot of you know, citrus, orange, peaches, honey. And then wow. that bang of spice. It's really, it's really interesting. It's really good. Will this be a limited release or a permanent release then? It'll be a limited release initially. And then um, we'll see how it does and lay more down. Very nice. This is the Chateau Pichon Baron that uh, we were discussing. And I'm going to try that next to the Pritchard Hill. And um, am I getting a just, I mean, I'm just looking at the two bottles. Uh, they're, they're about the similar colors. I'm not. The light in here is not perfect. I think but. if you put them up in the light, typically the Pritchard Hill is a little bit more. That red hue comes out a little bit more. Okay. Uh, about the same amount of time finishing, proximate or? No, no. Um, the Pichon Barone is about eight months. So 12 to 15 on the Pritchard Hill. Okay. And um, you, you're getting – there's – I try to find that apex on everything that we finish or any, everything that we age for that matter. So, so it I, doesn't need quite as long. Correct. Well, they're both beautiful and the wine is on both of them, but just like you were mentioning earlier, the Pritchard Hill has more of that fruit. Uh, there's more of that deep um, Bordeaux notes on the uh, Pichon Baron, a lot right. of earth, a lot of tannin, right? I mean, it's, it's beautiful stuff. This is such a nice one. I mean, this is really, really spectacular. Um, and I'm excited to know that there will be more <laughs> in the near future, in the next year or so. Um, but we're looking at really pretty much the same bourbon in both casks then, right? Correct. Yeah, it's just a cask doing the difference. The cask That's made it. all the difference. Eight yeah. months or so, Chateau Pichon Baron, 12 to 15 on Pritchard Hill. Um, yeah. We would have loved the, the, the Pichon Brown and longer, but it, I, that's where it peaks about the eight month plan. So, what happens when it goes further? When you know that it's gone further, what notes are you looking for that you know just aren't the ones you're looking for? It's usually too much of the wood, just too much in one way. You can call it tannins, you can, you know, it's just. You know, you try to push it as far up to that apex as possible without going too far. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I'll you know, go ahead and decide, okay, it's time to get it out of the wood and dump it. And then I'll leave barrels out there to continue to age to see, did we nail it right or did we need more time? And then you kind of try to hone it on each one. Excellent. Well, this is, um, this is delicious. They're both delicious. We've uh, we've tasted a number of those in the um, Jefferson's portfolio. There's plenty more, and there's plenty more on the way that we have to look forward to, like the rye finish and the cognac casks. In the yeah. And I'm sure plenty more great experiments. Uh, I'm also a huge fan of the Barrel Age Manhattan. That's always a great go-to as well. It is as well. One of my favorites, especially wow. during this time. You don't need anything else. You've been you've been pouring a little a little of that during uh during the shutdown. You've been enjoying a little of that at home. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of when I've had people drop by, that that goes pretty quickly. <laughs> I can imagine it does it does for me too, my friend. 
Well, what, as we look forward to um, everything opening back up, uh, bars, restaurants, the distillery, then again, we, we just had uh, Trey tell us about the news. Uh, June 8th, Kentucky distillers are allowed to open back up. Uh, what are you most looking forward to and, and, and what do you predict? I mean, what it, the future for um, Kentucky bourbon post COVID, what are you, what are you thinking? You know, I think it's kind of like post 2008 and prior to 2008, you know, bourbon was, you know, not in favor with very many people. It was in 2008 when the economy went south and people started looking for value. One thing they found it, they looked back at American products, they found it. And uh, they looked at something that had a story that they could share with a small group of people. And I think that's what's been happening during this um, quarantine time. Um, and you know, American whiskeys have, knock on wood, done very well. Um, if you look at the data of what's being purchased right now. And I think, you know, people might not be going on vacations as much. They might not be putting that addition on or, you know, doing whatever. But I think what we're seeing is that they will go out and buy a good bottle of bourbon because they feel like they're treating themselves and they are. And you know, what we try to do is we try to put a story with every bottle. And as we talk through each of these, I think there was a story that told you how we manipulate the juice one way or the other during the maturation process. Right. That is going to make it have an end result the way that it does. Right. And that's what we really do. We've got 19 different expressions of Jefferson's that we put out, 17 of which we do something different than what most distillers do which is distill it, age it, cut it to proof and bottle it. So we're putting more time, money and effort into the maturation process to massage the juice one way or the other to bring out certain flavors. And hopefully, and I've never made a product up from a boardroom. It's always been through an experience that we ended up collaborating with somebody and there inherently becomes a story that tells you why it tastes the way it does. <laughs> And you know, like Baskin Robin has 31 flavors of ice cream. We've got a lot of different ones. Some people are going to tend to like one more than the other. And that's great. Um, you know, that's one thing that I loved about the story of Pritchard Hill. The guy that hated it at first, but when then he opened his mind to it, he was like, wow, this is my favorite. So, right. so I think that, you know, the other reason in 2008 that things really started to, to pop was you could dig in and get information. You could jump on right. webinars like this and people want to share information as they're sharing a cocktail together. Right. No offense to Tito's people are drinking a ton of it, but you're not going to tell anybody about this bottle of Tito's that hasn't been said before. Right. With bourbon, and one of the reasons that it's such a great category is there's so many great stories. There's such great history. There's such meat on the bone that you can share. It's the story that makes it something that we can share together, enjoy, continue right. to build on with progress, with innovation. And you have done that more so than um, anyone in the business, I believe, you, with everything from the ocean, the barrel finishes. Uh, congratulations on all you've done, Trey. And thank you thank for. You. Uh, Yes, you're welcome. Thanks for being with us tonight on Bourbon Blog uh, yeah, Live. Right. All who's been watching and watch us every night, bourbonblog.com live at 8 p.m. Eastern every single night from now till we'll see when. And if you want to talk whiskey, uh, drop me a line, Tom at bourbonblog.com. Uh, thank you so much, Trey. It, it'll be uh, a real pleasure, hopefully, in June to see you and um, to have, a, to have some whiskey with you, buddy. You got it. To, to a real cheers where we can hear the glasses clink. That's right. We'll, we'll do it. We'll do a clink for now. Cheers. You got man. it. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank you. Take care. Right. Thanks, Troy. Great.